Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Gabe Arnold. I'm the technical director with the DLC, and I'll be presenting the introduction here today before handing off uh, to the team for more specifics. Uh, before we introduce them, uh, we just want to thank you all for your time today in uh, reviewing and commenting on these uh, specifications and participating with the DLC. We know this takes a lot of time, and we really value your input to make this uh, work best for everyone and realize the objectives. Let me introduce our Network Lighting Controls 4.0 team. Along with myself, we have Levin Nock. He is the technical manager of the DLC's Network Lighting Controls Qualified Products list and the version 4.0 revision. Levin will be providing a more detailed overview of the version 4.0 draft requirements today. We also have Bhagwat Mohan. Bhagwat is a technical analyst that works with Levin in managing our network lighting controls requirements and qualified products list. He will be in the background today monitoring and responding to the questions and comments that you submit through the webinar. First, here's our agenda. We'll start with this introduction before Levin takes us through the topics of cybersecurity, energy monitoring, and interoperability. We'll then conclude with some of the more minor changes to the requirements. We'll discuss the DLC stakeholder meeting, and then we will wrap up. Uh, the webinar is being recorded today, so if you or any of your colleagues miss it and would like to view it later, it will be posted to the DLC website on our news and events page uh, or our webinar page. Also, um, we have a lot of people on the webinar today, so everyone will remain on mute we would encourage you to ask us questions and direct you to the question pane of the Go, GoToWebinar interface to do that. Uh, the more simple clarifying questions, uh, Bagwat will be answering as we go. Uh, however, any more detailed technical questions, we would ask you to formally submit them along with your comments. Uh, you can also email us anytime with questions that you have as you're preparing your comments at the email address shown on the screen, comments at designlights.org. As with all of our uh, requirements and specification revisions, uh, we have comment forms that you can download from our website in order to submit your comments. This is the best way to ensure that your comments are included and considered. In this case, we've prepared a specific comment form for this version 4.0 proposal. It's in Excel and we've pre-populated it with the changes um, from version 3.0 to version 4.0 to make it easier for you to comment on them. So please make sure to download this form and use it to submit your comments and questions. Uh, as many of you know, we update our technical requirements for network lighting controls every year. Uh, the annual update process finalizes in June when all qualified products will need to requalify under the new uh, version 4.0 requirements. This year, we expect most of the products that are on the list currently to meet the new requirements, and Levin will be sharing a little bit of information about that uh, shortly. Uh, but if that's not feasible, then a product uh, does have a one-year grace period to remain on the network lighting controls qualified products list under the prior year's requirements before needing to upgrade or dropping off the list in the following June. We sent out the first draft of version four in early February and comments are due by March 12th. So I think we've got about three more weeks uh, before comments are due. At the stakeholders meeting in early April, which you are all invited to attend, we'll be exploring the comments that were received and refining the ideas That'll go into a second draft coming later in April. After that, we'll take more comments in May and then release the new final requirements for version 4.0 in early June. So that's it for logistics. Let's get into some of the content of the version 4.0 draft. The overall objectives of this version 4.0 revision are number one, to strengthen the value proposition of network lighting controls technology and number two, to address some of the key issues needed to improve market acceptance and uptake. And these objectives working towards a goal to accelerate the adoption, market uptake, and energy savings with this technology. 
we have focused on three topics with this revision aligned with these objectives and goals. The first is cybersecurity. This is the practice of defending network systems and data from malicious cyber attacks. It's an absolutely critical issue to address for customer trust and adoption of this technology. If we're going to install these systems and encourage customers to install these systems, we need to continue to address this risk of cyber attacks issue. The second focus area is energy monitoring. This is defined as the, the capability of a network lighting system to measure and report the energy consumption of each luminaire or group of luminaires. This data is of value to both utilities and energy efficiency programs, as well as customers, and we can use it to strengthen the value proposition of the technology with these groups. The third focus area of this revision is interoperability. This is the capability of lighting and building systems and components to be able to connect with one another. And not just connect, but, but to operate together in a defined and appropriate, a predictable way. It's, it's, it's really, it's the practice of being able to connect and share data uh, between and among lighting systems, uh, with HVAC systems, and with building management systems, as well as devices within these systems. When we're able to connect these systems in this way, we can unlock new energy savings opportunities. A simple example of this is by sharing lighting occupancy data with an HVAC system so that we can better optimize the operation of the HVAC system. But it can go far beyond that to building optimization and even grid integration. Uh, this is also an issue that customers want us to address uh, we're increasingly hearing that they do not want disparate systems that can't talk to each other, uh, and, and that's also why we're focusing on this issue. Here's what we're trying to achieve. Uh, first, we want to support network lighting controls that are developed and operated using best practices in cybersecurity. This is absolutely critical to both short and long-term adoption of this technology. Second, we want energy performance data to become a standard feature in network lighting control systems for the value that it can provide to utilities and users for, for a growing number of use cases. Third, we want our qualified products list to both characterize and enable differentiation of more interoperable systems. Not all systems offer the same level of interoperability and the ability to connect to other building systems. And we really want users of our QPL to be able to identify those more interoperable systems. So for example, um, we know that this is a issue of growing importance for the utilities uh, that are looking for uh, additional energy savings opportunities that can come from connecting these systems. So they might, uh, we want to enable them to be able to identify the systems that can provide that capability and perhaps that they may be eligible for some additional program support by utilities. I think this is also uh, of value to uh, designers and specifiers and end users looking to understand which systems can connect to other building systems. With these enhancements, we want to continue to support utilities and energy efficiency programs and providing more extensive support for the technology and then to see more network lighting control systems installed on more projects. All of this together driving accelerated technology adoption and energy savings. Uh, so, so these are the things that have driven the draft 4.0 requirements and uh, we look forward to uh, your comments and in input on them. I'll now pass things over to Levin to further, uh, to talk about further specifics of the draft requirements. Thanks, Gabe. So first, I'll review how the technical requirement document is organized, and then I'll go into the three main topics that are getting updated. This slide shows the table of contents. The main updates this year are in the multi-year plans, where there are three topics that Gabe mentioned, energy monitoring, cybersecurity, and interoperability. Each of these topics has some text in the multi-year plan section, and then it also shows up again in tables one, two, and three. I'll show an example of how that works for energy monitoring. 
This is the energy monitoring text in the section on multi-year plans. Any text that changed from last year is highlighted in yellow. In addition, in Table 1, the energy monitoring capability moved from a reported capability where it was last year in the right-hand column to now it's in the required capability this year in the, in the left-hand column. So it's highlighted in yellow here in Table 1 for interior lighting systems. It also moved and highlighted in yellow in Table 2 for exterior systems. Plus, in addition, Table 3 has definitions of each of the 23 capabilities. The energy monitoring capability is defined here as capability number 11. So to summarize, if you're interested in one of the multi-year plans, you need to check the text for that plan in the multi-year plan section, and you also need to check the tables. Now we'll get into the details for cybersecurity. Here's some background about the importance of this topic as lighting systems get networked. Up to nearly half of the organizations that Cisco surveyed back in 2015 had already experienced a security breach related to the Internet of Things. In 2018, in the USA, the average cost of a data breach was nearly $8 million. As Gary Meshberg wrote in the recent IES LDNA, the lighting journey the lighting industry can't afford to be the weak link in the Internet of Things. Briefly, here's the plan for cybersecurity that we laid out last year and are continuing to implement this year. This year, we'll set criteria for what counts as an official cybersecurity standard. Next year, in 2020, systems will need to be certified with one or more of the standards that meet these criteria. They'll have a one-year grace period, but by June 2021, all products on the QPL will be certified in cybersecurity. Currently, three products out of the 42 on the list are certified with an appropriate cybersecurity standard. All of, all of the other vendors will have a substantial amount of work to do in the next year or two to get certified, but we believe that this capability is essential for broad customer adoption. So here are the draft criteria. Um, first, it's certifiable with a standardized methodology that was either established through a voluntary consensus or through a federal agency of the USA or Canada. Second, multiple third-party accredited labs are available to perform the testing and the certification. Third, it applies to It includes at least three of the following. Uh, I'm just checking. Are people hearing me okay? I will continue talking unless interrupted. Uh, Hold on, and, Levin. Uh, you were muted at one point. If you could start over on this slide. Uh, I don't know what happened, but I think it's fixed. Okay, thanks. I will start over on this slide. So uh, this is an overview of the draft criterion. Uh, yeah, Gabe, it sounds like there's an echo of me, but I'm not sure what to do about it. Um, anyway, so here are the draft criterion that we've proposed. Um, now, this is the, the first time these have been outlined, so we're looking forward to getting comments about whether uh, how these will work for people. Um, basically, there they are. And um, here is a table of the standards that we're currently aware of that meet these um, various criteria. So uh, w one possibility we're considering is requiring the process and components section of cybersecurity uh, sooner and then the system and cloud services component of cybersecurity later. 
Um, we're also open to suggestions about if are there other ways that we can phase this requirement in so that it's um, it, it's a manageable burden for manufacturers. We're, these, are, these are some potential uh, future standards that we're aware of that might become eligible under these criteria in the next year or two as they're developed further. And there's also, we're, we're now looking into the SOC 2 standard, uh, the certification process for that. But if you know of, of either other criterion that you would like to add or other standards that meet these criterion, please include them in the comments form. Next topic is energy monitoring. So here's a brief overview of why energy monitoring is so important. At the Control Summit meeting last year, we spent a good part of the morning discussing how efficiency programs can help transform the market to broaden the adoption of network lighting controls. Over and over in the discussion from, from several different perspectives, we came across different ways that efficiency programs can do this work more effectively if they can collect energy data from incentivized projects. And here are a few listed. So a multi-year plan for energy monitoring was also started in 2018. And we're following that plan to require energy monitoring along with an energy report in the form of either a CSV file or an API uh, application programming interface. We expect most products on the list to offer energy monitoring of some kind by June 2019, but the remaining products will have a one-year grace period to remain listed under the old version three requirement. So here are the uh, main points in the updated energy monitoring definition. First, the, uh, there's a distinction between automated energy measurement versus numerical manual input. This year, both types will qualify, uh, but next year, the numerical manual input method would drop off unless there's a new standard to define its accuracy. This addresses the concern of, of some efficiency programs have noted that often when manual input is required in order to make the energy monitoring work, it, it often doesn't get done. Um, but automated systems will, uh, will definitely continue to be, um, to be a qualified next year and going forward. So that's one part. The next part is that output data is either regularly spaced or state change events. And if it's regularly spaced, then the spacing is 15 minutes or less. And the third part is that time-stamped output data is available in a record via either a CSV file and or an API. And there is the complete definition, which I will not go through now, but um, you're welcome to read it in the technical requirement. So when we look at the qualified products list, this is a summary of where products stand in terms of this definition. 22 systems meet the full definition, and um, plus an additional four meet it, but they have manual input required. So they're good this year, but uh, they may need an upgrade by next year in 2020. Uh, below that, five systems have energy monitoring, but they did not have an output record. And un unfortunately, without that output record, a lot of the use cases for the good that energy monitoring does are don't materialize. It, it really takes output of some sort that can be recorded and analyzed later. And finally, there are 10 products that do not currently offer energy monitoring, but we've been hearing rumors that some of them uh, may be introducing this capability in the near future. Next, I'll talk about interoperability. Um, we're proposing a new plan which is kind of basic now, but we want to, as a first step, we want to recognize interoperability as a reported capability. And this year, that'll be mainly based on 
information that we're already collecting and reporting. We just want to rearrange it a little bit to emphasize which parts are related to interoperability. And then we also are in the midst of planning a research project for 2019 to help define a, a multi-year plan in more detail. We, for our definition of interoperability, we are uh, describing it as the ability of systems or system components to transmit, receive, interpret, and or react to data and function in a defined and appropriate manner, which is modified slightly from uh, NEMA's version from the uh, C-137 committee. And this applies to either of the following types of digital communication. It could be within a system among the sensors and drivers and wall switches within one system. And it also can be between systems, between diff two different lighting systems or lighting and HVAC, lighting and BMS, et cetera. So here are the objectives of um, going for interoperability. First of all, we want to unlock energy savings opportunities. For instance, when systems are connected across building systems, um, when, when lighting occupancy sensors can be connected to the HVAC uh, equipment, that's one example of uh, when the systems are integrated, they uh, create new opportunities. Also, it makes operations and maintenance much more manageable which may mean that the energy savings that started when uh, a network lighting control system was new can persist better because the system is, is operated and maintained better over time. Second, uh, it will support broader customer acceptance because when um, facilities managers and, and people looking at portfolios of buildings are very interested in having a single dashboard to either manage their whole building as a whole or especially to manage their portfolio that, that may be many buildings. And if, if each different building has multiple different systems and they all have different software and anyone who wants to do anything has to learn all the different software and, and keep all the windows open, it just kind of makes a mess. And so, uh, we're hearing more and more that as, as customers look for the Internet of Things, they're really looking for the capability to support one single dashboard that, that at least has an overview of many different systems. And third, there's, there's a stronger value proposition. Much of the value that uh, people talk about with network lighting controls appears to be in the software, in new applications that can create new capabilities beyond what has been done thus far. And, and in order to create that, uh, interoperability at at least a basic level is, is necessary in order to have a, a software function that uh, functions the same in, in different buildings, across a portfolio, even in different wings of the same building. And this will also lower the integration friction with other systems. So instead of having a, a few star buildings with uh, custom integrated systems that can be more rolled out more broadly to many systems to generate, coming back to the top one, uh, more energy savings across the board. So our research objective in this uh, new plan that we're working on is to develop a public resource supporting NLC interoperability to help, for instance, to help specifiers uh, consider what use cases are important to them and to find appropriate products that will meet those use cases. And we want to develop a multi-year strategic plan, as I mentioned, um, to support this going forward. So that's a picture of the report that uh, doesn't exist yet, but it will. Beyond that, some other changes we're looking at are we considered um, we considered accepting horticultural lighting control systems that meet the current requirement, but we realized that horticultural lighting systems 
have different requirements in terms of what makes a good system, what can save energy, what can do its job well. Um, the the current requirements um, for interior lighting for people and for exterior lighting for people, which is what we're dealing with, they don't apply very well. So at, at least for now, we're excluding horticultural systems. Uh, we are, we did make explicit that if a building management system has a network lighting controls component of its functionality, then we can qualify that lighting controls component. We we do not claim to have any um, any specifications or requirement about the HVAC functionality or any other functionality of a BMS beyond the lighting, but just for the lighting functionality, if if it meets all the requirements then uh, we would go ahead and qualify it. And finally, uh, we changed the name of, of one capability that used to be called the Startup and Configuration Party. And it seemed like it was, um, to clarify that, we renamed it as Ease of Implementation. So all of these, the, all the comments, as Gabe mentioned, uh, please submit using the comment form. And you can download the comment form from online as shown here, and then submit the completed forms to comments at designlights.org, which is there. And also, I wanted to mention in other news about network lighting controls, we recently updated a summary of network lighting control programs. You can find that on the designlights.org website in resources, and then under resources, it's called the Efficiency Member Incentive Program Summaries. So this has a new, uh, let's see, do I need to click that? Oops. This has a new work tab called Network Lighting Controls. You can see down in the bottom right corner. And that worksheet, has a summary of nearly 50 um, programs throughout the US and Canada that support network lighting controls. So as a vendor, if you're wondering um, where incentives are available across North America, this is a good resource. And we're, we're working on uh, um, continuing to update this, but I wanted to let you know at the moment, it's a, it's a pretty good snapshot. And finally, I wanted to mention that the DLC stakeholder meeting this year has been combined with the control summit. For the past few years, DLC held an annual control summit where stakeholders could help plan the next steps in DLC's support for network lighting controls. This year, the lighting side and the control side of DLC are moving closer together, and we're combining both topics into a single event as the stakeholder meeting. This will be held on April 1st through the 3rd in St. Louis, Missouri, and we hope that you can attend. The agenda will look very similar to past stakeholder meetings, but there will be tracks for lighting and for controls in the workshops, the discussion sessions, and the breakout sessions. Here are the topics that we plan for panels and for the discussion sessions. So as you can see, some of them are also controls and some are solid state lighting and, and some, uh, a few are horticulture as well. So uh, in, in case some folks on the call may have attended the control summit, but not the stakeholders meeting, I wanted to mention that you are invited to participate in structured networking at the stakeholder meeting. And this is an exclusive opportunity for DLC efficiency members from utilities to meet in small groups with individual manufacturers of lighting and lighting controls. Uh, you need to register in advance for this. These sessions tend to fill up quickly. And the sessions are not facilitated by the DLC, but they provide you the opportunity to discuss topics that are important to your organization and build new business relationships. And thank you very much. So that, uh, that wraps us up.
Uh, thanks to Gabe and Bagwat for their contributions. And we especially want to thank you once again for your time in participating in this webinar and in reviewing the draft and providing us comments. Your input is crucial to develop a policy that best works for everyone. And we hope to see you at the DLC stakeholder meeting in St. Louis and hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.